Mm-hmm. And Tisa, for some reason, your screen's too big. Uh, to, I can do it in the, since it's just slides, I can put it in half of the normal uh -huh. window, if you'd like. You want to try that? Uh, will things overrun your window? Yeah, yeah they will. Okay, let's do it. Well, why don't you just... I can just put this, I can just open this microphone. Why don't you just shrink your browser? Yeah, you know, just don't have your browser full screen. Because I think then... Let's find out. That still goes full screen. So image processing, so it's a, a pretty vast subject. Um, there's, depending on the problem that you have and you're trying to solve, there's thousands of ways to try to attempt and to, to try to manipulate these functions and put in parameters to try to get what you want out of them. So what I'm gonna try to do in this talk is give you a sort of overview of some, some sort of basic processing techniques, um, show you um, some more advanced application areas, sort of what's possible. Uh, I think that's sort of good for this sort of short talk is just kind of show what is possible using image processing so that you can apply it to whatever your areas may be. And then at the end, I'll go through an example of a process, some image processing using photovoltaic cells um, from our group at the SDLE Center. So just right off the bat, these are the sources used throughout the talk. Uh, you'll see a lot of images from a lot of various places. These are where they're found at, and when I share the slides, you can go back and look at these in more detail. Um, all of the information, well, the majority of the information will be found in here. Um, off, uh, right to get started, SK image is what we're going to use mainly in conjunction with MATLAB, Plot, NumPy, SciPy. Those three are usually in any scientific uh, Python distribution, but SK image is going to be the additional package that I'm going to use and that I recommend using. OpenCV as a whole um, has been used for a very long time. But um, SK Images is, is sort of a, a newer package that has almost all of those capabilities, and it's, to my, in my opinion, very easy to use. You don't have to put in any external parameters to get yourself a first order sort of perspective. If you put in, if you want to use a function, you put the image name in and run it, and it'll give you some sort of output. Um, at the, with OpenCV, it's always been difficult trying to tune your parameters before you get anything useful out. So I like SK Image, and these are sort of the process to go through to, to get it on your uh, respective devices. I use Ubuntu, so you can just do a sudo apt-get install Python SK image um, on any on Windows and OS X. Um, you use like pip install or whatever your package handler is to grab them, and if you go to this link, you'll be able to um, access those. Um, I did, as, as I mentioned previously, the other three that I'll be using Matlib, uh, Matplotlib, SciPy, NumPy, those are in any classic uh, scientific Python distribution. And if you need any help, if you don't have those for any reason, those links will be able to help you uh, install those. So first, you're going to import your image. So um, standard file path that you want to wherever your image lies on your local machine um, using skimage.io, the IO module. You can use imread to pull in the image at that file path destination. And using just a standard um, IO imread, you'll get it as an RGB file, so you'll have a row column and then the Z value, which is one through three corresponding to R, G, and B. Um, and if you want to import that as a gray image, which is most of the stuff that I use, um, you can just say as gray is true, and that will weight the other three channels and then sum them together into one 
um, corresponding value at any x, y point. Um, both of these using SK image IM read appear in the like uh, variable environment as an 8-bit integer, so 0 to 255 values. Um, and then that figure generation at the bottom is through matplotlib. And I use that uh, just because using it in an Ubuntu machine, it, it pops up in a separate window very nicely. Um, you can use IM show in SK image as well and get the same outputs. On the left there is a electroluminescent image of four cell mini module, which we'll use in a further uh, demonstration later. And here's the gray image corresponding to those two lines of code. So taking you know, your three color weighted channels, I use gray images, but if you wanted to use color for some reason, you can um, weight those channels accordingly. So putting assigning zero to your other two channels. So R corresponding to, in Python it goes from zero, it starts at zero, the, the value doesn't start at one, like R does when you're like looping mm -hmm. through things, your vectors or whatever. So um, we assign zero to one and three for red, and then zero and two, skipping one for, for green, et cetera. And so you can see, um, how it divides out that individual image. So maybe you're looking for a parameter like this, this area of this mandrel. Oh yeah, this net view mandrel is used in like a ton of image processing blocks, so you'll come across it a lot. But if you want to like pull out this area here, it's a lot brighter with blue intensity. So maybe you want to pull out that uh, individual channel. Um, so for processing in general, so. Uh, more so, just in more advanced processing rely on good, pro uh, more advanced like techniques rely on good processing. So if, if you have bad processing techniques and you try to pull out a feature or try to extract some important value from internal to your image, uh, you're gonna have a really hard, pro hard, hard time. Any advanced processing rely or advanced analysis relies on good processing. So there's some, some techniques here, we'll go into more detail on a few of these, but there's a myriad of application areas. Some are good for, let's say you wanna keep it, an edge defined. So you're gonna do an edge detection later, you're gonna use some gradients to find an edge that you really wanna to maybe you find, pull out an object or something that's inside your image. Um, some filters are really well, they really do really well at defining, get rid, getting rid of noise and defining those edges. Others just do a, a smoothing effect, so they help to sort of um, lower the maximum pixel distribution in your histogram down lower, and you'll see this here in, in a little bit, just to create a smooth image that gets rid of fine details if you want to pull out a coarse, a large feature. Um, so another a common technique is using a global threshold and you're turning your, your image into a binary value. So back to like a, an, an edge detection style of uh, problem, if you want to find an edge, it's a lot easier to find it whenever your, your image has been thresholded between zero and one. Your, the gradient is a lot steeper than something that's continuous. Like in this region here, you can see that the slope is, is very continuous, but if you wanted to just find high and low values, if you apply a binary filter, this one is at the mean, so np, NPy mean. Um, anything below or above this gets pushed to zero to one. So, and it also allows for faster image processing because then this can be turned into a Boolean, uh, true or false. So then when you go through, um, you look at like SK image modules, they'll put a, a fast in front of the function. And that fast means that it'll run much quicker on a Boolean than on a um, continuous value or, or like integer or float or something like that. So for fast image processing, this may be effective for you. Um, another method is using histogram equalization. So what this does is it evenly redistributes the intensity values across your uh, full range of pixel values. So it still maintains rank order. So anything that was higher than a uh, pixel value higher than any other value remains higher than that value, but the distribution has been lowered out. So you get a high contrast. So you can see in this image here, much better feature definition um, here than you did in the original, in a, in a standard grayscale. That can be something useful you could use. This mouse troll. Yeah, it does great. Okay, uh, another, uh, like, another technique is blurring. So you do a weighted average of the surrounding pixels and adjust for localized values. So um, this may be good if you want to pull out this as like the main feature, you want to find that size, you want to find the eyes or something like that, but you don't care as much about the whiskers at the bottom. You want to try to get rid of that feature so it doesn't confuse your algorithms further down the line when you're trying to pull out that feature. Uh, you can use a blurring technique. And so that essentially will take any every pixel value and then um, in this case, it will weight all the values surrounding it 
and make it uh, more like the ones near it. So you could do like a median blur, which takes all the values, let's say you did what the size three, so it takes an individual pixel, all the pixels around it, three by three square, takes the median of those values and reassigns the one in the middle to that median. And so it helps smooth out that image. Um, that's sort of what this one's doing, with, but with a Gaussian filter, which is similar to like a bilateral filter, which it, as opposed to taking the median of the ones around it, it just plots a Gaussian distribution and takes the, the um, mean of that distribution in that localized region. So all this is just sort of to help try to define whatever your goal is. So these are all task oriented, whatever your task ends up being. Um, this could be different for, for two different problems. So trying to pick and choose what works best for you is always important. Um, here are just uh, filters as opposed to the, the blurring and the bilateral sort of filtering. Um, these here, as I just mentioned, the bilateral is really nice for keep retaining your edge. So um, if you want, like this guy, let's say you want to f find the, the outline of that guy's body or for some reason, um, a bilateral filter smooths out all the noise on the high and the low section but retains that edge. So it's good for like later if you want to do like a canny edge detection or something like that, um, you will be able to pull out that feature as opposed to something that has been smoothed, uh, you're going to have a really hard time finding that gradient. Um, the one here, you can see that's very pixelated. Our images are like this whenever we use our electron message camera where the values fluctuate a lot. There's a, a lot of noise in the image. And so something good for that would be like a median distribution there where it takes the value surrounding it and, re and finds the median and then assigns that value to the outlying region, which is which of those. So it just smooths that image out very nicely. So you can put in different parameters to sort of gauge how large is it summing from? How large of an area is it taking the medium from? So with those sort of basic techniques, trying to filter and, and process your image, uh, I'm going to show you just some, some sort of higher reaching uh, application areas so you can kind of see where these are going to be applied. I think that's very important for image processing considering there's so many different areas you can, you can apply things. So let's say here um, in this distribution you want to pull out these points. Right, so there, there's these things, these objects on the table, and you want to pull these things up. So here we do like something maybe like a global threshold, and we're able to see that we're not able to fully define these shapes in all regions. Right, it doesn't matter where you're where you're putting that value, you're still going to get this speckling effect. So maybe we try an edge-based detection. So this is using still on, this is all SK image functions can edge detection. So this goes through and it does a Sobel gradient. So it takes the gradient in the x direction, y direction and then ends up finding the, um, the edge corresponding to those peak values of the gradient. And then you could do something like filling in, binary filling these holes. So it, it goes and finds these edges and any relative pixels that are any, any values that are high and low, if there's a gap in between them that is smaller than whatever your value that you want to use for filling, um, it will apply the high values to those ones in between. So it kind of just combi combines and segments these values and gets rid of all the larger spaces in between. But as you can see here, it, kind of, it, it doesn't capture all of them very well because that's dependent on whatever the kernel value, whatever value you're using to close gaps, right? So that's a hard value you have to set. It's not very smart in that manner. So if we want to do something off of a like, region-based segmentation, looking at sort of its high and its low, and not necessarily its um, direct value, but its value relative to its background, something like this can be done. You can make an elevation map of these pixel values, and the, then we can then, relative to the background, segment them and pull them back out. So uh, that's a... I guess a, a very good way of trying to pull out individual values is, is by segmenting them relative to the background. You can almost use them as like a, it's like a contour map, a, a, like a, like a look, like if you were to, like, I think that's a great image here, this sort of, if you were to think of these things as a 3D plot, where would you segment, where would you cut off these pixel values? So, um, useful, you, I'm sure you can imagine many application areas that you may need uh, that, that would fall into this sort of category. Um, so this is a cool one, blob detection. I know some people that have used this for finding bacteria. So something like this. I, I know um, uh, 
there was one member in our group who used something similar to this for finding stars. You know, you're looking very deep. You're looking at something that's not necessarily needed to be defined. The image itself or whatever you're looking for doesn't need to be defined. It just needs to be counted and located. So you can do something like this and find these um, uh, blobs, right? Just, just like, so I can think of, you know, like sort of bubbles in your samples. A lot of, a lot of material science looks for, you know, how pure your samples are. So if you were able to take an image and track impurities using images, um, I had someone from Lehigh, a professor there, was looking at, at tracking carbon, carbon nanotube, um, uh, carbon nanotubes using infrared images in his samples. So you can use this sort of technique in, in a, a variety of ways. I'm just trying to give you some sort of perspective on how you can apply these things. And just for future, whenever you get these slides, you can look at more examples that are, that are possible. But just, just to give you a, a quick sort of I don't know, idea of what's possible using this, using this package specifically, right? Convex Hall, I'll show this later. Do they do facial recognition also? Yes, yep. Actually, depending, depending on um, how you pair these together, you can do facial recognition. Uh, Convex Hall sort of stuff that I'll show here in a bit. Corner detection, depending on what your patterning is. So all of these are available for at the, on this uh, at this site for you to look at. But the interesting thing about SK Images, any examples they put on this site, the data file is inside the package, so you can access the, the real data that they're using to to play with these sorts of images. So just kind of a uh, browser there, the free browser. All right, so. I'll show you an example of how I use these things to sort of accomplish uh, an image processing task. So starting with the original image from uh, one of the first slides, a left luminescent image of a PB cell, this is taken in the infrared. The nice thing is, is as soon as you get this image into a JPEG format, it doesn't matter how it was captured, right? We can always we can pull something from it as long as we can see it with our eye, we should be able to, to pull that out. With the proper amount of processing, we should be able to extract these features that we can see and recognize. So take the original image, image imported as a gray image, uh, apply a bilateral denoising. So this was the one to help keep the edges defined, not to smooth and, and lose that edge, with the goal being to pull out one of these cells onto its own image. And the, the issue with that primarily would be the fact that the edges are degraded, so you don't have a perfect polygon. It's not a, something that's easily defined. And on different orders of degradation, if these things were to impede further into the cell further and further, um, and you were, or you were to lose an edge or something like that, um, it would be hard to find that shape. So you want, you want something that is able to take into account these sorts of non-continuities, uh, this discontinuous edges. Anyway, so moving forward, so we've done uh, bilateral filtering. Uh, we'll use what does bilateral filtering mean? Bilateral filtering uses a, a, a Gaussian distribution in, in a relative area to uh, essentially def uh, reassign a, the, the value at that point uh, based on the distribution of pixels around it. And the one thing that is used, why this filter is used is it preserves the edge. So mm -hmm. as opposed to a smoothing technique which doesn't retain that edge as well. Yeah. Yes. The original image was in JPEG, right? Yes, it was. Okay. Yeah, that's a J the original image was a JPEG. And that came, so it's, I guess, a moment of background on where this image arose from. Um, this, so a normal photovoltaic cell, when you take in solar photons, excite across the band gap of silicon, you get DC output current. Well, if you were to take that same cell and push DC current back through it, you can actually get it to glow in the IR. So we uh, modify a camera at the SD Leaf Center that's able to uh, image those recombination events spatially inside of a photovoltaic cell. So using a modified Samsung DSLR camera, standard DSLR camera, you're able to see these recombination events spatially. And so these non-active areas, they're not able to re-emit, but they're also not able to capture photons in those areas. So let's say we used like damp heat at 500 hours, 1,000 hours, and we imaged it every single step, we'd be able to model the degradation of the solar cell using an image. So that, that's where these images arise from. Um, and this has obviously been degraded at, I think it was a thousand hours of damp heat. Mm -hmm. That's where this came from. You work with JPEGs, but they are uh, 
lossy image types as opposed to ROS. ROS Why yes, not work with ROS? Right. Do most people work with ROS? Uh, it, so I guess it depends on the resolution of the, of, or the order of the smallest feature you'd want to define. Right, so if the feature we wanted to extract uh, was, was large enough, it wouldn't matter necessarily how much was reduced mm -hmm. at any point. But uh, yeah, the raw image would be better if you're trying to find maybe, I don't know, some very small features somewhere, somewhere in here. Yeah, like hairline cracks maybe, something like that future, in a, for future um, analysis. Raw images would be better. Um, these are what they call super fine JPEG from the, uh, I guess they just have like a less of a loss coefficient compression whenever the camera outputs the image. But yeah, as, as a whole, JPEGs and PNGs and bitmaps are all lossy files. So yeah, you, it, I guess if you could, raw images would be better. So this here is an adaptive threshold. So what it does is it takes a block, certain size, smaller than the global threshold, takes one value cut off and just slices it through the image, right? Anything higher or low goes, goes to white and black like this. Takes a 500, uh, uh, I, I define the blocks as a 500, 500 by 500 area, and scans across the image and takes a, a um, it, it does an adaptive threshold, a mean threshold at that area. So it helps define some more of these features as opposed to, uh, did I? Oh, you'll see it on the next slide. Oh. There's that. Now let's go to this now so we can compare the two. Uh, global threshold where when you slice through the image, you lose a lot of those features, right, that we had on the previous one. I mean, sure, maybe this stuff in the center isn't as important that, uh, because you'll get a dip across the bus bars in between the bus bars just because the high resistance for the uh, electrons in the holes to recombine at charge periods to combine in those regions, farther resistance, farther a distance from the silver grid lines. So that's why you get that sort of a parabolic shape in the center. Um, but yeah, so comparatively, you can see that, that this is able to define more of those features. And so if we want to extract one of these cells, one of the biggest issues that I've come across is defining the distance in between two cells, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if you're gonna, in this image where it's been globally thresholded, you have some pixel values that sort of float across in this region. So if I were to do something to try to extract this whole area or to close these gaps here, I would also close these gaps. So what I decided to do was to do this adaptive threshold, which has this sort of pixelated exterior, and add it, make a composite image with a global threshold image to get rid of this background. You could also do a close, but as I said um, previously, you wouldn't, be able, you wouldn't be able to completely close these without closing the, the gap as well. So taking a composite image of those together, taking this image plus this image, we can uh, arrive at this one, which has a nice defined edge along here. Uh, more of the features showing too. A lot of these features that are still evident as they weren't evident in the global threshold image. And now if we take that and we close it, so we need to define a, a, a continuous image, a continuous blob of something, an art, artifact to extract. You can see here that all of these bus bars have been closed because they're a smaller area than, than this region. So if you just figure out what the distance is across here and just make that your closing value, these will shut like, like such. And also this gap would then now be bigger than these, so it doesn't close, you still have individual objects. And then finally, perform a convex hull, which finds the smallest convex set from any distance or, uh, that contains x, which x would be the object that it started wrapping itself around. Um, and this is good for enclosing dotted areas, obviously, from, from there to there. Those are your uh, final areas. And then we can use, I use SK image, or Sci, um, sorry, SciPy ND image for this. Um, it's the same thing as um, in, S, in the SK image, but the SK image sometimes will actually just use SciPy functions and just kind of repackage them in, so kind of cut out the middleman and just go back to SciPy um, and label these individually. So this assigns a value of one, two, three, and four to however many objects. Um, and I plotted this as spectral as opposed to, to gray, um, just so you can see them better. So now, if we wanted to pull out um, the individual cells, we could just say any value in, or any pixel in, in this image that has this corresponds to one, um, go and what I did is I mapped it from any previous image. So let's say I wanted to 
pull the pics, the image off of the original. I could just access the original image at the index value corresponding to whatever this, this region is, and then just map it onto a new space. So you take the index value corresponding to one or whatever it is here, go back to the original image, get the exact same corresponding pixel value, and then map it onto a new space. Does that make sense to everyone? Sort of, yeah, just since this image defines whatever the boundary region is, then you're able to then go back and access that index value. Index value is what is important for this. Okay. And then you're able to pull out whatever image you'd like. Um, that's the original one on the left. Uh, the middle one is from that, that composite image. And this one here was one that I didn't show you, but it was using non-local means denoising and a Gaussian adaptive thresholding to just define these cracks better. So it gets rid of a lot of that, I don't know, what are you gonna call it? fuzzy center. So now we can use this, and with what Roger was saying, you can pair this with like a facial recognition sort of an algorithm and use this for a characterization. So another member in our group is really is setting up a neural network to feed in a test set of about 200 of these images, um, supervised, so you, you, you segment it and say this is a clean image, this is a, what we would look for for a moderately degraded image, this is an extremely degraded image, you feed it that test set, let it learn what those values, or what those images look like, and then you give it something to predict upon, some sort of uh, test case, and then see if it can characterize just like the test, or the original test set was, right, or the training set. So that's sort of the future of, of this project. Uh, if you wanted to see the, the code, uh, we can go back to that in a bit. Um, as you can tell from here, there's some slight air, right, around these edges, and that has to do with in in this set, um, the cells, whenever they're manufactured, are not perpendicular. They could float in the encapsulant slightly and be rotated. So what we could apply, and I haven't done yet, but uh, is possible to do so if we'd like, is to use perspective transformations or rotations. So you just take those individual cells, you fit a rectangular polygon around it. When you fit it in this manner, uh, it's, it's, um, SK image outputs both the dimensions of the size as well as its rotation from its center axis, if this thing would be perpendicular to the screen, uh, perpendicular to like the edges of the screen. And so then you can just push it back that amount, right, remap it onto the original canvas, or it's new, the new canvas that it's on. Um, these, uh, yeah, and then, well, yeah, you test, yeah the, as I mentioned previously, they'll be tested further. So that's, that's sort of the talk that I had kind of going over all these topics. Uh, if you have any questions in more uh, specific detail, please feel free to ask. Good. That's, that's what I had at first. Mm -hmm. I have a question just to, yeah. you say for the detection of edge, you turn the image into binary, right? Yeah. So every pixel is now zero, one, or zero, so the one. scale is zero, two. Every pixel is zero to one, is zero or one, not zero two or one, or one, those two values only. And so that was why it's nice to turn those into like Boolean values, like true false values, because then if you wanted to say like, oh, it, you know, if one value is true false, it, it's, it, it, it reduces the number of computations you'd have to have if it was like a floating point operation or something. And how do you assign like zeros and ones? Is the contrast or the RGB? Uh, okay, so how, how would I, yeah. Uh, you so how would I assign it? Or based off of like a threat? So like, oh, like the threshold value. So let's say the original value when you import it is an eight-bit um, integer. So it goes between zero and two fifty-five. So there's a distribution of values that in there that compose the original image. So let's say I wanted to pull out, I wanted to assign zero to anything less than. Let's say I looked at the histogram and I saw that the mean was somewhere, or I can even just do mean and then np yeah. mean or whatever and you find where the mean's at, you can just push everything below that value down and up, just similar to how this is set up. You take the original variable, take the virus variable where it's less than a certain value, push it down, pull the other ones up. Just like that, yeah. It, that's actually a really nice inline computation that, that you're able to do in Python, which is, I don't think it's really, really useful. You don't have to loop through anything. Yes? Um, like memory-wise, every time you run something, is, is it creating a new image uh, and so in some of these cases, yes, and other ones they're just pointers to previous files. So if they, like in this case where um, 
you take these two original bilateral and, and binary adapted, those two images, those are complete separate images, and then adding them together into a third image. You could rewrite one of those other previous ones. I, for this purpose of like outputting all of the individual images, I, I just decided to make them separate. There are ways, yeah, you could even as you go get rid of previous images. Uh, but at, currently, yeah, they're being saved in line. Uh, yeah, you could, you could rewrite them as you go. Okay.